Welcome to the Full Moon Film Buff, episode 64. We are going to talk about Wolfen from 1981. I rented this from Amazon Prime. I had not seen this before. Before we get into the prominent crew and cast, I need to acknowledge that I'm changing how I tackle this. Let me know in the comments below if you like the change. Stick around till the very end and I'll explain why I made the change. Prominent crew. Directed by Michael Wadley, written by David Iyer, Michael Wadley, and Eric Roth, who is uncredited. Wadley was removed from the film after filming final reshoots in November 1980. Director John D. Hancock came in to supervise post-production, and more importantly, the film's dialogue. That said, Wadley did win an Academy Award for the absolutely amazing documentary film Woodstock. Eric Roth is listed as an uncredited screenwriter on Wolfen. He's most well known for winning the Best Adapted Screenplay Oscar for Forrest Gump. The cast includes Albert Finney as Dewey Wilson, Diane Venora as Rebecca Neff, Edward James Olmos as Eddie Holt, Gregory Hines as Whittington, Tom Noonan as Ferguson, Dick O'Neill as Warren, and Dale Berti as the Old Indian. Edward James Olmos is in one of my favorite films of all time, Blade Runner from 1982, playing a role he re reprised in Blade Runner 2049 in 2017. He also appeared in one of my favorite TV shows as well, as Admiral William Adama on the rebooted Battlestar Galactica from 2004 to 2009. Gregory Hines earned the moniker the Fred Astaire of his generation. Tom Noonan shows up in another werewolf movie released 33 years later. I enjoyed this movie a lot. It's not a werewolf film, and we'll discuss why later, but it is a great movie set in an interesting time and place with interesting and fun themes, compelling performances, and a great cinematography. There is a lot to discuss and enjoy here. Now, this movie has a lot of cool tidbits. Allegedly, Dustin Hoffman expressed an interest in playing the character of Dewey Wilson, only to be turned down by the director, Michael Wadley. Wadley, who fancied Albert Finney as his favorite actor, opted for Finney over Hoffman. It's the only time in his career that Hoffman was denied a part once he'd become a superstar. So let's cover the synopsis. A building in the South Bronx is demolished. Christopher Van Der Veer, a real estate mogul, hosts a groundbreaking ceremony. Later, Van Der Veer, his pearl-wearing, cocaine-snorting wife, and a bodyguard slash limo driver drive through Manhattan to the Battery Park waterfront. While exploring the deserted park, the trio become the prey of enigmatic creatures, perceptible only through their point-of-view shots set just above the ground and featuring an unusual thermal imaging color pattern. The unseen creatures kill all three individuals in quick succession. Their fancy, purebred dog is the sole creature with the awareness to escape. The next morning, former NYPD detective Captain Dewey Wilson is tasked to solve the bizarre violent murders. Wilson meets Warren, his superior, at the crime scene to get the rundown. Given the victim's money and jewelry remains untouched, robbery is ruled out as the motive. NY coroner Whittington is there collecting medical evidence. The victim's brains are missing. The NY morgue is a busy place. There are no signs of metal or weapons in the wound. Executive Security, the private firm employed by Vanderveer, believes that left-wing terrorists committed the murders. Wilson is skeptical since the victim's bodyguard was a 300-pound Haitian with voodoo ties. Faced with pressure from both the commissioner and mayor to resolve this case, Warren partners Wilson with criminal psychologist Rebecca Neff. The cops and private security are awash in technological gizmos to combat criminals and terrorists. In the South Bronx, a homeless drug addict explores an abandoned church scheduled to be demolished by Vanderveer's development company. An unseen monster kills him. Wilson and Neff investigate his murder. A stash of body parts is discovered in the demolition rubble. Whittington discovers identical hairs on the Battery Park victims and the South Bronx victims. While exploring the church, Neff is drawn by the sounds of crying to the precarious bell tower. Wilson follows her but does not hear the crying. Once she gets separated from him, he does hear a wolf howl. He goes up after Neff and drags her to safety. That night, a bridge worker is murdered by the same creature. Then the creatures spy on Neff in her apartment. Whittington verifies the hares are non-human, and Wilson consults zoologist Ferguson. Ferguson immediately identifies the hares as belonging to Canis lupus, also explaining that there are 40 existing subspecies, and he can't narrow it down. Ferguson's foreshadows his own death when he asks incredulously, what are you trying to pin on the big bad wolf? He compares wolves to Native Americans, giving Wilson his first real inspiration. Wilson tracks down Eddie Holt, a Native militant activist he's arrested years ago for killing a conservative Indian, or Apple, 
uh, native who is red on the outside but white on the inside. Wilson interrogates Holt on top of the Manhattan Bridge. Holt claims to be a shapeshifter, which implicates him as the killer, and even implicitly threatens Wilson. Feeling the conversation is circumstantially potentially dangerous, Wilson opts for a tactile retreat and tails Eddie that night on his own terms. Eddie gets naked and runs around on a river bank, mostly to screw with Wilson's head. Whittington discovers the body parts in the Bronx are all diseased castoffs. Ferguson lists all the ways wolves are awesome while watching humans shoot wolves from helicopters in disgust down in Central Park. The creature ambushes and kills him. Oblivious, Wilson spends the remainder of the night with Neff, where they hook up. The creature watches through the window. The next morning, a man in a jogging suit crashes Ferguson's motorcycle in front of Wilson as he leaves Neff's apartment. Whittington has verified killings using this same modus operandi across the country from Philadelphia to New Orleans. Whittington is the second person to foreshadow his death, and he says, if violence comes, I'm ready. I'm a dead shot and a karate expert. Executive security continues investigating the terrorist angle. Whittington and Wilson stake out the church, armed with sniper rifles and sound equipment. Whittington is killed. We finally see the beast, and it is a huge wolf. Traumatized, Wilson flees the church and ends up at the nearby Wigwam Bar, where Eddie and his friends are gathered. The natives reveal the true nature of the killer as Wolfen, the wolf spirit. They explain that the Wolfen have extraordinary abilities and might even be gods. The Wolfen have chosen new hunting grounds in the slums, targeting the weak and outcasts. Eddie tells Wilson that he can't fight the wolfen, saying, you don't have the eyes of a hunter, you have the eyes of the dead. The leader, Old Indian, informs Wilson that wolfen kills to protect its hunting ground. Meanwhile, executive security apprehends a daughter Damarung terrorist cell in connection with the Vanderveer slaying. Wilson resolves to abandon the Vanderveer case, but he, Neff, and Wilson's superior Warren are cornered on Wall Street by the wolfen pack. It was hard to tell exactly how many there are. Warren flees but is killed when a pack member severs his hand and then decapitates him in his car. Wilson and Neff blow up Warren's car with the pack member in it and then run. When the Wolfen pack corners them in Vanderveer's penthouse, Wilson unloads his gun and smashes the mobile of the construction project that threatens their hunting ground. Trying to communicate, the threat no longer exists and that he and Neff are not their enemies. The Wolfen seem to agree. They vanish just as the police barge in. Wilson claims that the attack was made by terrorists. The story ends on the assumption that Goddard Damarung takes the fall for the several serial murders. In a voiceover, Wilson explains the Wolfen will continue preying on the weak and isolated members of the human herd, as humans do to each other through class conflict. Wolfen will continue being invisible to humans because of their nature, not that of spirits, but as predators, who are higher on the food chain than humans. The last scene is Eddie and his friends looking at the city from the bridge. There is no transformation scene and no werewolf makeup job. There are some awesome looking wolves in the movie, however. So I said before that this isn't a werewolf movie. Let me explain why. If we take Eddie at his word when he explains to Wilson what is going on in the wake of Whittington's death, then we are dealing with supernatural wolf spirits, uber wolves, if you will. Cool, but not humans that shift back and forth into wolves. Eddie does claim he is a shapeshifter, but we never see any evidence of that in the movie. We just see him screw with Dewey's head over it. According to my research, this is one of the few movies that used actual wolves in it. Director Michael Wadley reported that a dozen police sharpshooters were employed and positioned all over the shooting location as the wolves were considered wild and uncontrollable animals. These sharpshooters had orders to shoot to kill if a wolf got out of the enclosed area. One real World War tidbit is that this film was set in New York. New York was originally settled by the Dutch and was called New Amsterdam. Wolfen is the Dutch word for wolves. I saw a claim that the Dutch also called the natives Wolfen, but I couldn't confirm that. So take that with a grain of salt. The original script for the film did open in the 17th century. The first thing I want to talk about was Wolfen vision. The film pioneered the application of thermographic visual cinematography in depicting the Wolfen's point of view. So let's discuss it. Thermographic cameras, also known as infrared or thermal imaging cameras, create images using infrared radiation instead of visible light. These cameras are sensitive to wavelengths ranging from about 1,000 nanometers to 14,000 nanometers. While this technology has numerous practical applications, thermal imaging cameras have also made their way into the film and television industry. Directors and cinematographers leverage thermal cameras to capture visually compelling footage. 
Iconic films like Predator and Sicario used thermal cameras to create striking sequences. Action or thriller films use them to represent military or security applications. Science fiction or horror films use them to represent otherworldly perspectives, supernatural or alien. This type of effect shot has been used in movies to show the POV of a character, usually villainous, like a beast. Infrared cameras can reveal hidden elements, emphasizing the eerie and otherworldly aspects of a narrative. The blurring of reality and the supernatural in these visuals adds a layer of intrigue and suspense to the storytelling. The capability of thermographic cinematography is in its ability to visualize heat differences in a scene. In filmmaking, it allows directors to create surreal and evocative visuals and emphasizing the emotional or psychological states of characters. For example, a warm and passionate scene may be rendered in vibrant colors, while a colder hue can be used to convey tension or mystery. Dialed to its fullest extent, it shows a heat map. Used less intrusively as it was in Wolfen, it creates an otherworldly effect. Despite its artistic applications, thermographic cinematography presents challenges. The equipment used for infrared filming can be expensive and the process may require additional expertise in post-production to achieve the desired effects. The Wolfen DVD sleeve notes that the Predator's perspective was simulated with the use of a Luma crane and a Steadicam camera. As technology advances, the accessibility and affordability of infrared cameras continue to improve, allowing more filmmakers to experiment with this unique tool. <clears throat> now, watching this film, I was struck by the shots of entire blocks of empty, abandoned buildings and rubble. I've seen New York be dirty, crime-infested place in movies. I don't recall seeing it depicted as skeletal and empty. So I did some research and learned quite a bit. The visual portrayal of New York City of the late 70s and early 80s in this film, Wolfen, reflects a tumultuous period marked by economic challenges, social issues, and urban decay. The depiction of entire blocks as empty, decaying buildings and desolate landscapes serves as a reflection of the harsh realities faced by the city during this era. Let's discuss the factors contributing to New York City's decline, including the economic downturn, high crime rates, and the resulting building decay. The 70s economic downturn left New York City grappling with high crime rates, widespread unemployment, and a decrease in city services. These challenges led to a decline in property values and a lack of investment in building maintenance. Property owners struggled to afford necessary repairs, resulting in visible deterioration of buildings. Abandoned structures became susceptible to neglect, vandalism, and squatting, accelerating the process of decay. High crime rates, including property damage and arson, further exacerbated the problem, with arson destroying many structures. The vicious cycle of building decay contributed to the perception of urban blight and discouraged investment in affected neighborhoods. It was a vicious cycle as the factors fed on each other and built into a corruptive storm. New York City faced a myriad of social issues contributing to this sense of urban decay. The 70s and 80s witnessed widespread crime, homelessness, and drug-related problems. Vast areas, particularly in the Bronx and Upper Manhattan, were marred by arson and crime. The fear of crime permeated public spaces, with some areas deemed unsafe even during daylight hours. The city's fiscal crisis added to the challenges, leading to layoffs of thousands of workers, including essential personnel such as police officers and firefighters. The film's depiction aligns with the dystopian imagery prevalent in American cinema during this period, with movies like Taxi Driver, The French Connection, and Death Wish reflecting a pervasive sense of social order breaking down. The Fear City pamphlets distributed by the visitors in 1975 exemplified the exaggerated warnings and some misinformation prevalent at the time. The city's image was further tarnished by a perceived breakdown in public order, reflecting in the decline of public amenities, increased vandalism, and the prevalence of adult entertainment establishments everywhere. Wolfen captures the essence of New York City's challenges in this era, portraying a city struggling with economic hardship, social upheaval, and building decay. The visuals of abandoned buildings and desolate landscapes serve as a stark reminder of the complex urban landscape characterizing this tumultuous era. Despite the inaccuracies in some warnings, the film and historical accounts emphasize the multifaceted challenges that shaped the city's narrative during this transformative time. NYCinfilm.com verified several claims in the film regarding Native American populations in New York working as iron workers on bridges and skyscrapers both back in the 80s and even today. This creates a fascinating juxtaposition as a population with strong ties to nature and the natural world resides in one of the largest cities globally and plays an ongoing role in its maintenance and construction. 
Of course, we cannot forget that the island New York occupied was originally purchased from local indigenous tribes by the Dutch. Regardless of one's stance on formal land acknowledgement practices, contemplating the area's long-term history adds an intriguing layer. Even old New York was once New Amsterdam, to quote they might be giants, and didn't always exist as a megacity, and it has evolved significantly over time. This leads us to the final theme I'd like to explore, the dynamic between high and low technology in the film. The Wolfen, supernatural and spiritual beings, exist without any technology. As Eddie suggests, they might even be nature gods. Their existence remains entirely beyond and unaffected by human technology. So let's draw some comparisons. The highest tech group in the film is executive security. From their high tech command center, they track the limo using radio communications and video surveillance. Despite all their advanced capabilities, they are unable to protect their client from the unseen Wolfen attacks. The security firm's intelligence gathering results in the wrongful arrest of individuals unrelated to the attacks. I don't know if Goddard Damarung is completely innocent, but they admit any of the kills that we see in the movie. They are innocent of these particular crimes, and executive security has no idea that they've got the wrong perpetrators. Their cutting edge lie detectors prove more obstructive than useful, acting as a high tech blindfold that hinders their perception of the world around them. Cops, including the morgue and the biologist, are next on the scale. While they make use of technology, it doesn't exclusively dictate their approach. Although unable to fully apprehend the Wolfen, they maintain a peripheral awareness of their presence, relying on instinct, not entirely overwritten. The natives occupy a middle ground, employing technology, albeit in a more primitive version involving steel and iron cables rather than advanced copper wire. They possess knowledge of the Wolfen, revere them, and acknowledge their formidable power. And that brings us to the Wolfen themselves, creatures entirely indifferent to technology. They not only eschew its use, but they seem capable of disregarding it altogether. The Wolfen evade surveillance cameras, only revealing themselves to human eyes when they desire to be seen. They navigate the penthouse apartment effortlessly, transcending the limitations imposed by technology. So I said I'd talk about why I'm making the change, why change the cast and crew discussion. Truth be told, I felt like I was wasting time and effort just summarizing artists' IMDb pages, taking too long to get to the werewolf discussion, which is the point of the channel. And so I'll continue to credit the writers, directors, and effects artists and actors, but I won't try to highlight non-werewolf career information that you can easily find online if you're interested. I will still talk about my personal favorites and those that I find suitably notable, those artistically important and interesting enough to do so going forward, but I won't talk as much about everybody. So if you like Lycanthropes, like, share, and subscribe. Contribute your thoughts and additional com comments below. Let me know what I missed or what you noticed. Next, I plan on discussing Horror of the Wolf from 1973. Keep your eye on the moon, a silver bullet in the chamber, and we'll see you back next episode.